All righty, Genesis chapter 11. We left off on a very interesting story on the Tower of Babel. Uh, lots of interesting things here. I will go through a little bit of review. All right, so fresh review. Remember when they were building this Tower of Babel, it's not just, uh, it's not just a foolish endeavor that we're going to reach to heaven, they can't ever make it, and that's what the critics will say. But then how we answer these critics is, no, they were legitimately, uh, legitimately trying to achieve something. Recall Genesis chapter 11 when uh, they started building the tower that uh, God said at verse 6, if you recall, this they begin to do, right? Building the tower. And then God says nothing will restrain them from what they have imagined to do. So in other words, it shows right here that nothing's going to stop them, even if they were to hit all the way up and then they found out, oh, this high elevation, I can't breathe, I can't do it anymore. No, God knows that they're still going to build or uh, attempt something. So it took God to come down and to stop them. So it shows right here that this Tower of Babel, it's not some kind of foolish endeavor. They were really trying to reach up there. So then, how was that possible? That's what we were wondering, right? And then I showed you some interesting verses when we looked at Ezekiel chapter 1, Revelation chapter 4, and uh, Revelation uh, chapter, uh, yeah, chapter 4, and then Acts chapter 1, and then the book of Job, that they were trying to open some door or portal up in heaven. And then remember that I showed you why that was very, very much the case if we look at scriptures. So then, if you look at the scriptures, we looked at several passages. One which is pretty plain, John, he was looking up at the sky, but then he saw a door opened in heaven. But then, all of a sudden, it says he was immediately in the spirit, and then right in front of his face was the throne. So then it shows right here that there may have been some portal or door, but, you know, the scripture is plain and said door. But what made things more clear was that the book of Job, we found out that the sea that Job was talking about was definitely referring to the sea of glass. That much we did know. And if it was referring to the sea of glass, it said the bottom of the sea were clouds. That was very interesting. There was something that had to do with clouds where you are automatically tr uh, transported or you see heaven. And then you recall Ezekiel 1 and then Revelation 4 about clouds and a rainbow. And then a throne is suddenly over there. So then I pointed out to you that these clouds that we see up in our heaven, the atmosphere, somehow have some sort of connection with the clouds where the sea of glass is at the third heaven. And then I pointed out to you before, through all these verses, uh, that even scientifically speaking, that they knew that there's a huge body of water up there in outer space. And it would make scientific sense where you go something, uh, the states of water, the three states where it goes something gaseous like clouds, then liquid, and then what? Frozen. Yeah. That's why the top of the sea of glass is frozen, which would make sense. And then the scientists, they came up with these theories and Einstein tried to do something about black holes somewhere deep in outer space where not even light can go through. And then there are some of these sci-fi movies that try to put something where you enter through this black hole and then it enters into a whole different realm. So even scientists were proposing such thoughts and ideas. So then all of this seems to connect and make sense, but then it became even more clear when we looked at 1 Thessalonians 4 and Acts 1, when Jesus Christ uh, went up, the Bible says a cloud took him and what? Out of their sight all of a sudden. Well, we know where Jesus went up to. He went to heaven, but it took a cloud. So it shows right here these clouds have to do with something transporting. If Revelation 4 is true, that that is a door or a portal to heaven. But then what also made more sense was 1 Thessalonians 4. It says... We're going to be caught up in the air to meet him in the clouds. Yeah. But then that verse says, so shall we ever be with the Lord. That pretty much sealed the deal. So it showed right there that once we go up in the clouds to be with God, 
It just says all of a sudden, so shall we ever be with the Lord. Why? Obviously, it's not up in the atmosphere, unless that atmosphere is connected somehow to the third heaven, which would make a lot of sense why uh, the second heaven, where, you know, the stars, the galaxies, and all of that is located, why that might be called space or outer darkness, so to speak, right? Because it's all dark over there. So it's like you can skip that. It's like you can skip that. Why? Because if you know the doctrine of the Genesis gap, the darkness is not good. So there might be something. So this would make a lot of sense with other doctrines that you learned as a Bible believer. Why God did it this way. But it also makes sense uh, if you look at so many cases throughout the scriptures where there were prophets who were on the earth who claimed that they uh, saw heaven or you know, they saw a vision of God like Ezekiel 1. How is it that Ezekiel from down the earth just saw heaven like that? Unless it was a door opening up and then he saw it through there. Stephen, where he saw Jesus standing on the right hand of God. And a lot of other verses. So it shows right here that it would make a lot of sense if we believed there was a portal over there. So, but that's why the Bible would call it windows of heaven, right? Like a window. Uh, Song of Solomon is very interesting when you read that talks about a lot of verses where it seems to point out that God is looking through down on the earth and that you can go up there just like that. But anyways, uh, this is all just a fresh review from last Genesis study. I'm trying to refresh your memory. Now, if they're going to try to reach some door or portal up in heaven, how are they going to do it? And then I pointed out last time, which is extremely interesting, was that why is it that these people who had an infatuation with these sons of God. That's why they built idols, right? Idols were created because it was trying to follow the imagery or trying to restore a worship of the sons of God. Uh, you see these cases in the book of Acts where these people, the Ephesians, talked about some kind of image, Diana falling from heaven down on the earth. Why? There, all these images came back to sons of God, all the way to the sons of God. So these people, uh, the Bible talks about devils and spirits who are behind the idols as well sometimes. So it shows right here that uh, we know that the idols have to do with sons of God. They have to do with devils. They have to do with Satan. But then why is it that they have an infatuation with putting them in high places? Right? And then why is it, like I taught you before, there's always some kind of sexual sin involved. Right? Those pagans back then, they always had... A huge amount of cases with temple prostitution. It was very wicked that time. But they had an infatuation with high places, temple prostitution, and then somehow connecting with uh, those devils or sons of God. So then, why is that? Then I read you a quote, um, Herodotus, where he mentioned about, so interestingly, they mentioned about temples on high peaks. Why? So that it was said by the pagans, especially the early Chaldeans, right? And that's where Nimrod, the Tower of Babel's location is, supposedly, approximately that area. That they would say, uh, the Egyptians, Sumerians, or Chaldeans, that they would say it was done where there is no image up there on the top of the peak of the temple. And that it would be a beautiful woman who's a virgin up there. And that it was deliberately done where she is left alone, all on top, up in the high place over there. Why is that? Because of Genesis 6 where I pointed out why, what made those sons of God come down. There was only one. There was only one. It was because of sex. Now, that's what I taught you, which is very, very strange and which is very dangerous. Why did 1 Corinthians 11, for example, or other passages warned about women with their covering because of the angels? Because angels, the fallen beings, they have everything of this world. They own everything. There's just one thing they don't have that you humans have. That's the women. That's the reason why angels, they're males. And then Genesis 6 says they saw the daughters of men, they were very beautiful. That's one thing angels don't have. They got everything except that. That's why they wanted that. That's what they came down. But that's what it seems to show right over here is that these people, what they could be trying to do is trying to make a high top that would try to connect some door or portal in heaven. And just like Herodotus and those early pagans taught back then, try to put a beautiful woman on top there. Why? Conjure them down again. 
starting Genesis 6 all over again. That's why God would stop them. And that would make sense why God would stop them. Why? Because every passage where God intervened, where he would have to put a stop in humanity, had to do with sons of God, right? Uh, what first case? Genesis 1, Lucifer, the sons of God. That's why he sent the pre-Adamic flood. Second case, Noah and the flood, which is pretty obvious, so sons of God. Third case, Tower of Babel, but let's just skip that one. All right, fourth case is what? The land of Canaan. God wanted, the, uh, wanted to prevent the Canaanites from spreading, and he wanted annihilation, like genocide pretty much. And why is that? Because, remember, there were giants over there. There was intermingling again. Remnants of the son, sons of God carrying on. See, God wanted to put a stop to this. Why? Because, as I've taught you before, what Satan's goal is um, in Thursday, uh, Wednesday night's Bible study is have to do where he wants to get rid, rid of anything that has to remind him of God's image on the earth. He wants to see his image, Satan. That's why the last case is what? Tribulation. Why does God intervene? Put a stop to that one. Sons of God come down again. And there is intermingling, Daniel chapter 2. Mm -hmm. See, so that's why it makes sense that the only case is the Tower of Babel then. And if we put the Tower, if every scriptural case and the scriptural evidence points out in every case God intervened because it has to do with sons of God, why not the Tower of Babel then? So we, it makes a lot more sense why God put a stop to it. It's because they're trying to do something of Genesis 6 all over. But it also makes sense with Nimrod and Semiramis when you study their history. Why does it take a beautiful woman, Semiramis? Why does she put something seduction, seductive in her religion? Why did Revelation 2 and 3 talk about Jezebel carrying on Nimrod's religion, right? Has to do with fornication and idolatry, right? And Jezebel... If you recall from your Genesis study, she was from where? Z uh, Zidon and where, if you go northern Israel, who was the one carrying that Babylonian Nimrod religion? Had to do with that Levite and those Danites who carried on Nimrod's religion. And if you remember your intermediate discipleship class that I taught you, it's that northern part of Israel where you go uh, Dan and then Zidon and then Tyre and then what? Phoenicia. But Phoenicia had access to all those cities and territories. And the Phoenicians were the one who spread out that Nimrod religion. Now it's so amazing that some old man that people thought was very, very crazy because he doesn't know what he's talking about mentioned that in his ad lib commentary, Old Testament. Crazy guy, isn't he? He doesn't know what he's talking about. It t and there was no technology that time, you got to realize. He just read books from scratch. He had a computer brain. There was no doubt about that. It took me 10 years, 15 years later to finally catch up and understand that with technology. So don't, be, don't take for granted your Bible-believing heritage. The, the Lord laid out before us. We're very thankful for them. That's why we believe in, uh, that's why we believe in supporting fellow Bible-believing preachers, missionaries, and each other. And then the people who are older than us and the people who passed away and went up to heaven because we're carrying on that heritage, that knowledge, and then we can give it now to you people. You people get to hear all of this. Why? It's a combination of knowledge from so many generations before us. Amen. All right? Dr. Ruckman uh, would not have given you the knowledge that he gleaned had it not been people before him as well. There were so many dispensationalists before him, uh, many preachers who laid out before him. Uh, the independent fundamentalist Baptist movement, even they themselves, Dr. Ruckman uh, went to schooling over there, so then he was actually raised with the right foundation. So all of this has to do with foundation after foundation before us. Uh, Dr. Peter S. Ruckman is the gold mine where he just culminated everything together, and we're the spoiled children who take all of that for ourselves now, and we can build more upon it. So let's be very grateful for our heritage. So for people online who says, where do you get all this knowledge? It's not because I'm smart or a genius. I'm just spoiled. I gleaned from all the Bible-believing preachers and predecessors before me and am able to deliver it this way to you. All right. Now, anyways, I say all this, all right? That was fresh review, right? A lot. Now let's build upon this more. All right, let me give you some interesting cases. Let's go to Genesis 11. I'm going to show you why 
this doctrine might be true about a portal op opening up in heaven. They're trying to do something there. All right, I'm going to give you several more cases of this. Why? This might be the case. First of all, let's continue on in verse 7 <clears throat> and then verse 8. Go to, let us go down and there confound their language. Now, isn't it interesting? God, he likes to put a mock. He likes to put a mockery to these Babylonians. You might say, why does he want to do a mockery? So he's trying to mimic them. And he's doing a mockery of them by mimicking them. You might say, what's the case? Well, the first one is go to. That's what God said. He said, go to. Let us, he said, go to. Let us go down. That's what he says. Now, go back. Remember, look at verse 4. What did those Babylonians say? Go to, let us go up. And then God's like, go to, let us go down. See, so that's God's way of mocking them. So there's no doubt that from this case, God is mocking them. Now, I'm going to show you a second thing how God mocked them, which is going to be incredibly eye-opening and prove the doctrine later, okay? But anyways, let's continue reading on. So God is mocking them. He's saying, come on, let's go down. But he, notice right here, he says, let us, right? God says, let us go down and there confound their language, so God says confound, that means to confuse, disrupt, right? So he's going to confuse their language. Because remember, they were all one language at verse 1, correct? So God wants to disrupt that. That they may not understand one another's speech. So that way they don't understand each other at all, all right? That way they don't understand each other's speech at all. It's like putting Robert Randall with uh, Min Jung Kim, all right? And then you'll get a Tower of Babylon. They cannot understand each other's speech. Even in English, they cannot understand each other, okay? So that's, that's an example of that one. Now, the thing is this, is that, so there is so much confusion through this uh, Tower of Babel incident that the Lord did, but it's so interesting that, the, uh, that verse 7, God says, let us, right, confound the language. But in verse 9, it says, the Lord did their confound the language, right? Did you notice that there? Okay, so that means what? Uh, this is a case that people don't like to believe in, but it's true, that God is a trinity. Amen. So notice the Lord confounded the language, but it said us right there. So yes, we believe God in three persons. Because if you look at the word us in your Bible, uh, it's pretty interesting. If you look at the word, uh, I think it was in Malachi, uh, but it, I would encourage you to look up the personal pronoun us and then compare that with other personal pronouns, and then you're going to notice person in there or people. So it proves right here that God in three persons is a biblical concept, that there is a trinity. Now, we see right here that it is the Trinity, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. That's why they, uh, in, as one God, they went down and then confounded their language so that they don't understand each other. To confound their language is to disrupt them from building up something. Now, let's look at the book of Colossians 2. Colossians 2. Colossians chapter 2. Now, I told you that Paul may have warned about this. He may have warned about this. You might say, really? Yeah, there are two cases here. <clears throat> Look at Colossians 2, and then we're going to go to 1 Corinthians 11. And this is what I indicated before about the women's covering, 1 Corinthians 11. This is interesting. This is something you need to understand here. What's very interesting right here is it might be possible for mankind to do this again today, okay? It is possible that mankind has the capability to access and contact the aliens, which you notice they're trying to do right now, right? The evolutionist scientists, they laughed about it, but now you get Neil deGrasse Tyson and these people who are so smart and saying, you know, there might be life out there. 
What they laughed at as a fairy tale back then, now they're saying, you know, it might be the case. Who's the one laughing now, you know? The atheists, they were the ones mocking us back then that, you know, God created us, you know. It's like saying aliens created us. Who believes in that? Oh, 10 years later, you know what? There might be aliens out there. And, they don't, and they're not humble enough to admit and say, I'm sorry, I was wrong for making fun of that back then. See, it's wicked, evil people, right? See, they don't, mankind is so evil, they can't even notice their own fallacy that they made. <laughs> but anyway, they have the capability to contact these aliens, angels, or whatever you want to call them, right? You might say, how so? Well, here are a few cases that might show this. Let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And then we'll look at 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And then verse 10. For this cause <clears throat> ought the woman to have power on her head because of the what? Angels. Now, uh, when I gave this Corinthian study, I taught you last time that I wasn't sure what it meant. But I mentioned that in, uh, in some teachings that it might have to do somehow with uh, the sons of God coming down and with Genesis 6. Uh, well, now looking at Genesis uh, chapter 11 and then looking at a lot of cases, uh, personally yours truly, I believe in that. Now, I'm not saying that this is uh, some kind of doctrine that you must believe in and etc. No, this is something really deep and then, you know, I encourage people to take more time to study. And if this is something on your shelf and you can't believe in yet, hey, I have no problem with that one. And yeah, I encourage you, don't believe in something that's sketchy. You need to be persuaded yourself. All right, what's so important about people nowadays is when they get into deep doctrine that uh, they automatically blurt it out and then teach it as fact when there are some sketchy areas that they're not certain themselves. It is very important that you're convinced yourself from the scripture what the Lord shows you. And then other people who are not into that as much yet, you need to give them time. Why? Because they didn't take the journey like you did in studying all those verses and in prayer. All right? They just heard it out of the blue from you in 0.5 seconds in today <laughs> that you just hear it. And you hear all of this information. You're like, some of you are probably thinking, is this true? <laughs> you know? So it takes time. It takes time. So I encourage you, look back to the verses that we looked at before, the points that I made, and you pray yourself, and this is even better, you look it up yourself. Look at the certain words that we looked up, and you look it up yourself, and you might find more verses that will convince you that I can't convince you with. All right, so that's what I encourage you all to do. But anyways, uh, if we're going to look at Colossians 2 now, Colossians 2. So it seems like that you can use women to conjure up and bring down the angels, perhaps. Okay? That might be the case. Now let's look at Genesis, uh, not Genesis, Colossians 2, excuse me. Colossians 2. We'll look at verse 18. Now this is very interesting here. <clears throat> the Bible says, Let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. Uh, intruding into those things which he hath not seen, vainly puffed up by his fleshly mind. Now, uh, it is normally taught, and uh, I think I may have mentioned this before. When we look at verse 18, <clears throat> it mentions here voluntary humility and worshiping of angels, right? It says worshiping of angels. So, we can see right here, okay, if we were to go back to what I mentioned earlier, right? idolatry, some kind of admiration or contact with the sons of God. We can see that in Colossians 2, verse 18, worshiping of angels. But remember that I've taught you with idolatry comes with sex, fornication, right? They're always intertwined for some strange reason throughout history and even in the word of God. So then our question is, well, is there something sexual? Yeah. Verse 18, voluntary humility. Because it's voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. So basically humility of angels. And you might go, 
Uh, I don't think so. Isn't that referring to aestheticism? So I'm going to tell you two pointers here, all right? So one, it could be referring to aestheticism, all right, where there's this uh, false humility, right? There is such a sin called false humility for some of you who didn't know that. Just because you pretend you're humble and you act all humble, and then you might be the person where somebody compliments you, that was a good preacher, and you might go, yeah, yeah, give God the glory, but no, that's just false humility. You're putting on a show, right? The Pharisees, Jesus warned about them eat who are prideful, that they do false humility, right? Like they put on the, uh, the ash and they pretend to be humble, but actually they're prideful. So uh, there's false humility. So it could be the case, but secondly, this could be something sexual with angels. Now you might say, why? Look at Deuteronomy and Judges 19. Look at Judges 19 and Deuteronomy 22. Deuteronomy 22 and Judges 19. You might say, why is that? This is going to be eye-opening. Now, some of you who know your Bible, I'm sure might agree with me with this. You know that humble does not mean just one definition. Do you know what uh, humble means also? It also means where you have forcible intercourse with somebody else. It's rape. It's a sin of raping. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 22. Look at verse 25. But if a man find a betrothed damsel in the field, and the man, what? Force her and lie with her. Then the man only that lay with her shall die. You notice that, right? So that's obviously forcible intercourse. But look at verse 24. 24. Then he shall bring them both out unto the gate of the city, and he shall stone them with stones that they die, the damsel, because she cry not, being in the city, and the man, because he hath what? Humbled his neighbor's wife. Interesting. Go to Judges 19 now. Judges 19. Scripture with Scripture. Notice right here at verse 24. Behold, here is my daughter, a maiden, and his concubine. Them will I bring out now, and what? Humble ye them, and do with them what seemeth good unto you. But this man do not so vile a thing. Isn't that interesting? It uses the word humble. Now go back to, keep your hand at Judges 19. We're going to come back here because I want to show you an uh, interesting connection. But go to, back to Genesis 6. Genesis 6. Do you recall uh, what I taught you last time? Who was to blame for the sons of God coming down at Genesis 6? It wasn't Satan. All right? Somebody else was to blame for that one. It was mankind. Genesis 6. All right. Now, let me repeat this again from last Genesis study. So let me do, set it up. Genesis 6, we know that's talking about the whole human race sinning and messing up and making God mad, right? What is the sin that got, that got God's first attention in Genesis 6? There is a sin that got his main priority and attention first before he mentioned the other sins. What was it? Genesis 6, 1. How did the Holy Spirit start out? What started his attention? Men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born unto them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were fair, and they took them wives of all which they chose. That's the first thing that got God's attention as he paid attention to mankind's sin, Right? So it's that intercourse, that fornication uh, with the sons of God. And then what did God say? God said at verse 5, so verse 4, so 1, 2, 3, 4, all that has to do with the intermingling, right? That God is upset with. All right, the intermingling with sons of God. And what did God call that at verse 5? And God saw that the wickedness of man and the sons of God, no, the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every imagination of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. God put the blame on man for what happened at verses 1 through 4. Why? Because 1 Corinthians 11, what did God warn the women? God warned mankind, the women, about their hair. Why? Because of the angels. See, it seems to show here that mankind is the one 
that can bring down or conjure up the angels. Why? Because we're seeing that right now. That's why. Mankind always has some kind of demonic infatuation, whether you're an atheist or whether you believe, whether you're spiritual or religious, they have an infatuation to contact devils for some weird reason. You get the Catholics who have an infatuation to contact dead spirits. That's demons right there, right? They call them saints. They like to put a good word for that one. Catholics have an infatuation with worshiping uh, demons or devils. Excuse me, uh, saints, icons. And it's not worship, okay? It's called reverence. See, they just replace saint names with pagan names, right? Jupiter with Peter, Venus with Mary, which is Nimrod Semiramis. See, mankind always had an infatuation to contact uh, sons of God. It's so weird. Uh, atheists, lost atheists, uh, they're talking about scientists and NASA. We're, we're going to try to find life out there. You hear last year, uh, no, this year, too many cases about, from mainstream news about, from the Pentagon intelligence agencies that they've confessed and admitted, yeah, we built up stations and programs to contact aliens out there and unidentified flying objects. Even Obama admitted that. Remember, I gave you a quote from him on that. So see, even lost atheists or secular people have an infatuation with that. Witches, the, the, the most demonic system you can think of, Satanism, witches, and all that, what do they want to do? Contact spirits. See, mankind always had an infatuation with that. Some kind of dark thing. So we're seeing how they're trying to conjure them up and talk to them, communicate with them right now. So why are you surprised with Genesis 6 that they've been doing that? Of course they've been doing that. They always had an infatuation and want to do that. That's the strange things about these beings. Strange thing about these beings. Human nature does not change. Uh, what's the quote? What men learn from history is what, church? Men never learn from history, right? All right. So mankind's repeating a pattern every time. Now, so we can see right here mankind's responsible. Uh, interesting that I taught you last time, Genesis 6.5. God called all of this intermingling with the sons of God imagination of their hearts, right? Tower of Babel, what did God say? Imagination of their heart, right? So there's no doubt God knew that they're repeating Genesis 6, imagination. There's something about their imagination I don't like. So I'm trying to put a stop to them on that one. So I taught you that last Genesis. Okay, mankind's the one conjuring them up. So then mankind, don't be... So then what is Paul warning? Paul then is warning possibly... That if we go back to uh, go back to Colossians two, all right, keep your hand at Judges nineteen, but go back to Colossians two. What is Paul possibly warning then? He's possibly warning then, when we look at verse eighteen, let no man beguile you of your reward in a voluntary humility and worshiping of angels. See that? So Paul's warning about mankind getting you involved with what? Trying to get involved with the angels being humbled. And they were humbled, right? Jude says they left their first estate. They left their glorious state. They were humbled when they came down. So then that's what mankind's trying to do again. That's what Paul could be possibly warning. Now there's a second case why this may be, which is even stronger and more interesting. Let me show you now how this all ties together. Genesis, book of beginnings. But I taught you so so many times there is such an importance with history, okay? You got to understand your history. People don't learn from history. Look at the pattern in your Bible, and then everything is going to make very interesting sense. When's the first time Satan tried to attack and do something with mankind? It's Genesis 3, right? All right, now I taught you a really crazy teaching, which I said was which I told you is not a doctrine, but it's a int very interesting theory, and it would make a lot of sense with the other stuff. The serpent, all right, uh, we know from the book of Corinthians, what did he do? Uh, he, the Bible says he beguiled Eve, right? All right. Now, with that word beguiled Eve, I mentioned to you that when you look up that definition, it has sexual... Notations, it has sexual tones in there. 
So it means to charm, to seduce. That's the reason why it makes a lot of sense where there would be sometimes uh, a naked woman with a python or a serpent around her. Why do they make uh, big deals about that one? There's something that they, they learn that. They get that idea from something. It's something within their psyche, human nature. So the serpent beguiled Eve, I taught you that it may have been possible. And Dr. Elkman, he indicated it, but he didn't go too deep into it. But he mentioned right here that perhaps Satan, when he got Eve to partake in the fruit, that there was also something physically, sexually involved. And then I gave you too many verses on that one, so I'm not going to do it here, all right? But let me just tie everything, okay? The point is, if that was true, that he tried to charm, seduce Eve, and then Eve got involved with that one, and then Cain, and then a lot of the other people, they may have come out through the lineage of Satan or the serpent trying to start some kind of seed, and then doing that with Genesis 6 as well, if it may have been possible that it's literally they, they had some kind of physical inclination with Satan where he charmed it and did it before, that's why in Genesis 6, those fallen angels, it's not like something new to them. Like, oh, how do you do this? No, they've seen their daddy do it before. So it would make sense why this might be the case with the fallen angels, how they did that in Genesis 6. They're following the example of their daddy, so to speak. Now, if that was the case, then I gave you a different one right here, this other theory. What if something went along, something happened to Ham, right? Where Ham, I showed you in Genesis uh, 9, it is so interesting, a lot of the wordings there was similar to the case of Genesis 3, right? where they had to do with drunkenness, the grapevine, and sex is involved with that one. And there are too many verses that have to do with the grape, uh, fermented grape that's tied to sex, and Eve, what she ate was a grape, and all of that. And then Ham, he got involved in that. There was, some, there was sexual, no doubt about that, Genesis 9, what Ham did. The theoretical part, though, is if Satan did something with that one. Why do we think that? The reason why is only in Ham's line do you hear the mentions of those giants coming out, which is very interesting. From Canaan specifically, and, the, and Noah pronounced specifically the name Canaan when he put the curse. So there's something going on there, all right? There's something going on. We don't know exactly what happened, but there is too much of an un, uh, uncanny similarity right here where it matched with Eve, what Satan did with Eve. All right, now, if there was a connection, right? My, what's my point? My point is, you have an adversary, the devil, okay? And he's trying to accomplish a purpose. Do you see a pattern now so far, right? Okay, now we come here, the Tower of Babel. Do you see a pattern going on somewhere here? Let's go to the next case later on. And that's why in the next case, uh, why is it Satan wanted those Jews to intermingle, see that has to do with the seed, with the Canaanites. And God wanted it, no. Like, no. Why? Because there's that Nephilim, that sons of God uh, genetics from the Canaanites and etc. See, this is all tied to something right here. This is very, very tied. That's why there's a corrupt bloodline. That's why... God made a big deal about blood. And he tied grapes with blood, quinky dinky, when we do the Lord's Supper. And we need a pure bloodline. That's why we have Jesus Christ now, right? But anyways, uh, going back, and that's why we get a raptured body, right? Flawless when we uh, get raptured and go to heaven. Uh, but anyway, uh, I, I'm getting too deep. I'm connecting too many stuff. But the point is right here is that you see this right here, this pattern. So then... Is he trying to do something right here that he did in the past with Ham, fallen angels, the serpent beguiling Eve? Well, Colossians 2, verse 18, what builds up the case more about here is let no man what? Beguile. Yeah. Whoa, interesting. Yeah. See, mankind's try, uh, mankind is capable of repeating a pattern that the devil did with them back then. All right. 
But look at Judges 19 now, okay? Your hands there? All right, look at Judges 19. Now look at the wording here. Verse 24, isn't the wording right here similar with what Lot did, right? What did Lot did? Lot said, uh, let me bring out my daughters. You do the vile thing with them, right? All right. So this is, if we go later on, and we'll get there later on, Sodom and Gomorrah. What was going on with Sodom and Gomorrah? They were following the example of those fallen angels. Go to Jude. Go to Jude. All right. Go to Jude. See, there's a pattern going on here. Mankind is following a perverted, wicked example. Look at Jude. Look at verse 6. Verse 6. Jude 1, verse 6. And the angels which kept not their first estate, but left their own habitation. What does that mean? That means that intermingling, when they were humbled, right? Those angels intermingled with the humans. Okay, we can agree with that one, Jude 1, 6. He hath re so that's Genesis 6. He hath reserved in everlasting chains under darkness unto the judgment of the great day. But notice the next part says, even as Sodom and Gomorrah. What does even as mean? In like manner. In similitude, following the, the example. Oh, so Sodom and Gomorrah followed the example of what? Verse 6. What those angels were doing. It had to do with fornication. Strange, weird fornication of intermingling with a weird stuff. Well, I don't believe in that. Well, just keep reading verse 7. And even as Sodom and Gomorrah and the cities about them in like manner, giving themselves over to fornication and going after strange flesh. See, that's plain. So we see right here, there's no doubt, there's a pattern that Satan's been doing. That's why God had to intervene with what? With Sodom. Burning it down to the ground. See, every case where God intervenes has to do with something with those sons of God. It's so weird. It is so weird. But I mentioned he intervenes in the tribulation too, right? So they can't do it now, and they're trying to do it now, and Paul warned about that. Don't get involved with these people who try to conjure them up. Why? Because if you get involved with these people, NASA, evolutionists, scientists getting involved with these experiments and projects and all that, what happens if you like to get really deep and involved in that one? Spirits praying to saints and all that? What happens when you get involved in all that? I'll tell you what happens when you deeply get involved in all this. It's pretty dangerous. Look at uh, Isaiah 9. Look at Isaiah 9. And then we're going to look at Revelation. We're going to look at Isaiah 9. And then Revelation 13. We're going to look at Isaiah 9 and Revelation 13. What happens when you get deeply involved with that one? You will join the New World Order, the Antichrist, where they will conjure him up. Now, praise the Lord, saved Christians, we get raptured before the tribulation. So we don't have to join the Antichrist system. But you see what's going on with this world. They are violating Colossians 2 right now. They're violating Colossians 2, and they're trying to conjure and bring down those sons of God. There is no doubt about that. They're trying to do that right now. And there's, uh, look at Revelation 13. Uh, Revelation 12, excuse me, Revelation 12. Look at this one. The Bible says in verse 3, And there appeared another wonder in heaven. And behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns and seven crowns upon his head. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven and did cast them to the earth. Okay, so notice right here that the word of God reads that the dragon, Satan, he takes a third part of the stars of heaven, right? Which is referring to those fallen angels, right? This is the case if you look at uh, Revelation 12 and verse 9, right? Verse 9. So then those are referring to those angels or what the Bible would talk about, those fallen angels. With these fallen angels, 
they go down to the earth through the red dragon. But what is it? Uh, how? How does Satan do that? Through his tail. That's important. Through the great dragon's red tail, he thrust, he got those fallen angels to come down. But here's the thing. So what about the tail? Yeah, there is something what. This tail is representing something. Who is the tail? I mean, after all, the dragon's heads is supposed to represent the Antichrist, right? Or the leopard that comes out follows along with the dragon's heads, right? The crowns. But what about the tail? What does it symbolize? Isaiah 9. Can you guess? What about the false prophet? Well, Isaiah 9. Isaiah chapter 9. Notice what the Bible says. It's very interesting what the Word of God reads here. Isaiah chapter 9. And then we'll read verse, uh, I think it's uh, 13. For the people turneth not unto him that smiteth them, neither do they seek the Lord of hosts, right? Therefore the Lord will cut off from Israel head and tail, uh, branch and rush in one day. Okay, so then the Lord, he cuts off the tail. But who is the tail? Verse 15, the ancient and honorable, he is the head, and the prophet that teacheth what? Lies, false prophet. He is the what? Plain. He's the tail. Revelation 13, what does a false prophet do? He calls down something from heaven. He calls down fire from heaven. You get that dragon who blows fire. Just a thought. See? So mankind, they will do it again. And it takes a false prophet. One world religion. One world religion getting involved in that one. And then scientists, do you think they'll get involved? Oh yeah, science and religion will heavily get involved in that. Really? Yeah, look at Pope Francis. He has a project called Lucifer, coincidentally. <laughs> and then somewhere, what, in Arizona or something like that? So then he wants to what? Have access to the aliens. He talk, he's talking about baptizing aliens and stuff like that. Yeah. Weird stuff. And I'm talking about a couple years ago. All right, I'm not talking about this year. I'm talking about a couple years ago. They've already been setting things up one by one. All right, go back to Genesis 11. See, they're all tied, all right? All the way to Genesis 3. You see this? What's the point? The point is this. That I taught you a Wednesday night Bible study. Satan wants to get rid of anything that reminds him of God's image and replace it with his own image one day. That's why Revelation 13, the Bible talks about they worship the image of the Antichrist. But I taught you... I'm getting really deep. I'm just connecting everything together. But I've taught you, which is very interesting, that, you know, why is it people worship idols? I mean, uh, why do people make a big deal about images, infatuation with idols and images? It don't make sense unless, you know, God's not talking about an image that is like, uh, that is uh, in our physical plane, human plane, but rather something virtually. They're all called idols and images. Remember, idol does not, uh, does not only mean like some kind of image that's in front of your face that is in this world terrain. No, it also means representation. And then uh, the metaverse is what? Image that are what? Graphic representations. And people want to be, what? They want to interact with the image. They have an infatuation with the image. Right? Just, what's it? Yeah, the metaverse. Yeah, the Facebook, correct. Change it to meta. That's why I exactly mean, sir. That, what, what are they all doing? They're preparing a way for this one day. It's called image right there. Uh, in the advertisement, you see a, per, a person who violates God's image, how he originally set up creation. You get a transvestite saying, I can be whatever I want. So that person's not content with even just the biological form. Wants to be a digital, virtual something else. Why? All of this is what? The devil bringing his coming down, intermingling with what? Mankind hating the way God originally created creation. And let's replace it with Satan. I just love how you created things. I love your image as we worship it. I want to become that image. Look like that image. You don't believe that, huh? Pagan, it's been common. 
pharaohs and these people, what do they want to be like? Those sons of God. Be like them. It took it as an honor. You already got the brainwashing going on in Hollywood. I want to be like Superman. I want to be like... Um, uh, the, I, I want to be like all these superheroes, Marvel, DC, etc. See that? You think people, uh, back then, people would not, look, would not want to look like a green monster until you got the Hulk. And people, they'll paint themselves green and they don't care and they think it's an honor. And they have an infatuation and they have a desire to look like that. Okay, Genesis 11. I tied everything together. That was the interesting part of everything, all right? That's why I had to connect everything right here. They're all, it's a pattern. The Satan's doing a pattern right here. Why do you think God makes a big deal where he has to change our image at the rapture? You don't think Satan wants to imitate that. Okay, Genesis 11. Enough. Enough's enough. I'm going to never end this. All right, let's look at, let's look at verse 8. Verse 8. Great, I can't even cover the generations, but I have to at least cover this. Eight and nine, all right? Let's finish off the Tower of Babel. Verse eight, so the Lord scattered them abroad from thence upon the face of all the earth. Okay, so that's self-explanatory. God Almighty scattered, all right? So he spread them out. He divided them. He spread them all out abroad from thence. So, all, uh, so like far away, all over, spread out upon the face of all the earth. So all over the earth, the surface and the face and the land of the earth, spread them all out. That way they don't unite. And they left off to build the city. So now they left off, uh, they left NASA alone, thank God, all right? They abandoned NASA and they said, we'll never land on the moon and stuff like that. Until mankind found a way to unite again after World War I, right? Then they start to unite again. Then the, you get these claims that, like, we landed on the moon or we found this in outer space and stuff like that. See that? See that? God said not, uh, nothing will strain them from what they have imagined to do. The only step away is just this step from atheism into something religious. That's the only threat. Now you got CERN and these people opening up to something spiritual or demonic. They even use the word demons and devils but they cloak it with scientific terms. They don't want to put it as much as how we would view demons. See that? But see, that's how God can make that bridge with, uh, not God, that's how the devil obviously can make that bridge with science and religion now. They found scientific terms to replace religious terms. Verse 9, therefore is the name of it called Babel. So that's why God called it Babel, when he scattered them out, when he confused their language at verse 7 and 8. Because the Lord did there confound the language of all the earth. The reason why God called it Babel is because he divided and confused the language. So Babel, when you, the Old Testament is originally written in Hebrew, right? So this is a Hebrew word originally. So Babel means confusion. That's how God did it. That's how he did the Tower of Babel. Now keep reading here. Uh, the Bible reads, uh, And from thence did the Lord scatter them abroad upon the face of all the earth. And from thence, from that time, what? From there, God scattered, spread them out abroad upon the face of all the earth. Made sure that they don't meet and unite and scatter. As I close it here, I'm very, I'm very convinced that they were trying to open up a portal and door. You might say, why? Okay, so go back to Genesis 10. Genesis 10. Genesis chapter 10. Genesis chapter 10, and then verse uh, 10. Genesis, Genesis chapter 10, verse 9 and 10, 9 and 10. Even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. So notice that when Nimrod, which we know he was trying to start something, right? He called it Babel. So the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. But wait a minute, I thought Genesis 11, it was called Babel. Let me show you something My opening here. Nimrod, when he was trying to build this thing, Babel is a Hebrew word. Nimrod comes from, very interestingly, Sumerian Akkadian sources. That's his origins and roots. So when he named the kingdom Babel, you know what Babel means in Sumerian Akkadian? 
Gate of the gods. <laughs> then I'm like, ah, uh, I see. They were trying to build something. But then the Lord, uh, he, uh, that's why when you look back at Genesis 11, what is God's uh, sense? If Satan tries to mimic God on something, God mimics the devil back as a mockery, right? Remember Genesis 11, 4? Go to, let us go up. And then God says, go to, at verse 7, let us go down, right? So it makes sense he's trying to follow that. In his mind, when he launched that plan to confound the language, he wanted to mimic. So he says, okay, Babel, gate of the gods, let's confuse them. You got a brilliant God. If there's one thing you've learned, don't mess with God. These men thought they were so smart with their PhDs and NASA and technology and like, yeah, we, we can make it up there. And God is so brilliant, like, let me bite back at you, all right? Let me follow your terms of semantics and rules and what you came up with. Go to, let us go up. Go to, let us go down. Babel? Yeah, I'll call it Babel back at you. <laughs> and the scientists today, when they say Babel, Babel, Babel today, they're just uh, using God's term. Babel means confusion. Stop babbling to me, yeah. etc. They just, they just confirm God is much more wise than them. All right, that's, uh, there's your story of the Tower of Babel. God, my Father, I pray today's teachings have been eye-opening about the tactics of the enemy and how he's trying to set up the world today. And uh, may we not fall prey into that system. Help us to be wary of that, but not be infatuated with it. Help us to be more infatuated and obsessed with the fruits of the Spirit, with souls getting saved, with our important work. Help us to only be wary of the devil's devices in which it motivates us to spread out the gospel more, to plant the church, and to be careful of our enemy, of how he's trying to set things up and then destroy the churches. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. All right.